Good day to you, my friends. I'm Father Tom Lucas. I'm the new pastor of St. Ignatius Parish. And as a way of introducing myself to you, I'd like to share the story of St. Ignatius in a few episodes here. Throughout the world, in this time at the end of July, Jesuits celebrate the feast day of St. Ignatius on the 31st of July, the anniversary of his death. He died in Rome in 1556 on the 31st of July. And every year, we remember him, and we remember all the people with whom and for whom we work, all of our colleagues and friends around the world. This year, what I'd like to do is to share a lot of images with you. I'm a visual thinker. I'm a visual teacher. And over the years, I've collected a whole treasure trove of, in, of images of St. Ignatius in his place and time. And I'd like to share some of those with you as a way of introducing you again to St. Ignatius, our founder, uh, founder of the society and uh, the patron of our parish, as a way of us celebrating him together. So thank you for your attention. There'll be several of these over the, the next week. Keep your eyes open. Thank you. Even saints have to start somewhere. And this is where the story begins. In a narrow, apple-lined valley in northern Spain, 40 miles from the sea, a place that looks like Napa or Apple Hill, a place where a clan lord of the Loyola family owned a small castle, really a farm, a fortified farm, that looked something like this. There, as clan lord, as one of the loper, lower and petty nobles of the area, he gathered together his family, his 12 children, his wife, his outliers, and ruled the area with some ferocity. Here we see that same valley today as urban sprawl begins to creep in at the center of that valley where two arms of the valley come together, a basilica now, standing over the place and enclosing the house where, where young Inigo Lopez de Leola was born in 1491. It was a little fortress, and over the door of that fortress, a coat of arms showing two wolves in a stew pot. We don't exactly know why. One conjecture is that it's a, a kind of pun on the family name Loyola, Lobos and Oya, wolves in a pot. It could also refer to the fact that the Loyola clan were known both for their generous hospitality, but were also ferocious and people to be reckoned with. They weren't high nobility, but they lived comfortably. Here, the salon of their house, restored in 1991, the Loyola clan was devoutly Catholic. Here we see the private chapel of their home, decorated with a painting given by Queen Isabella. Isabella, seen here with her husband Ferdinand and their daughter, the Infanta Caterina, who was the long-distance object of Ignatius's affections. They unified Spain even as they expelled the Moors and the Jews and they funded the first expedition of Columbus. The world was expanding, expanding radically from the circumscribed space of, of the Iberian Peninsula into the width of a new world as Columbus and then further explorers began to, uh, to cross the Pacific. And soon that small world came to resemble the world that we know now a world that was explored, that presented new horizons, a world where Inigo's brother died in Panama in 1510 when he was a child. As the twelfth child of a semi-noble family, there weren't many career paths open to him. He could become a cleric, a priest, he could become a scribe, or he could become a soldier. And it was that soldiering bent that uh, he followed. He was sent to, to be a page in the court of the uh, royal treasurer, 
and after a number of years at the court circles, uh, he he was uh, named a kind of justice of the peace in the small kingdom of, of Navarre next to his own province in the Basque region. And it was from that place that he embarks on the great adventures of his life. He was a man of his time. He was educated. He was courtly. Not very well educated, to tell the truth, but he, he could sing and dance and prided himself on that. He was attractive. He was uh, enamored of the trashy novels of his days, the, the, ta the tales of knights and, uh, and their ladies. That world consumed him, and he looked towards a future that would be full of adventure and romance. That all came to an end, crashing to an end, in 1521, when he was in his late 20s. He was a commander of a small regiment in a battle at Pamplona in northern Spain against invading French troops, a really unimportant battle in an unimportant war. But there, in the midst of the battle, he was seriously injured. His leg was shattered with a cannonball, and he was carried home to the family castle some 50 or 60 miles away with the understanding that he was going home to die. Those were brutal days. He suffered gravely. Uh, barbaric surgery was performed not once but twice on his leg to try to enable him to, to walk and then to dance again. As he began to recover, he grew more and more impatient. He asked for novels. He asked for things to read for entertainment. But the only books available in the family house were two, the lives of Christ and the lives of the saints. And in desperation, he began to consume those volumes. As he read those volumes, as he began to pray, as he began to, to look at his life, he has visions, visions of St. Peter, visions of the Virgin Mary, and as he begins to reflect on what makes him happy, what makes him sad, what brings him contentment, what brings him sadness or desolation, he realizes that the more he reflects on the world of, of God, the world of salvation, the more contented he is. And the vanities of the world give him no satisfaction. He stares out his window and begins to dream. He dreams of heroic deeds. That's the world he lived in when days in days of old when knights were bold. He dreamed of going and doing great things for God as Francis had gone to try to convert Saladin, to outdo Francis and Dominic in their work for the church and for God. And so it is that as he recovers after a long and painful nine-month period, he leaves his home he limps across Spain and finally ends up at the Benedictine Monastery of Montserrat. He has a vague idea that he would go to Jerusalem to undertake a new kind of, of crusade. And it's there that he prays, he makes his confession, and keeps an all-night vigil, as the medieval custom was for knights, this time in the chapel before the, the image of Our Lady. He leaves his sword, he changes his clothes with a beggar, and before he decides to embark on this pilgrim journey to Jerusalem, he goes to a small town close by called Manresa, and there, over the, spirit, the period of 11 months, he prays, he fasts, he goes to extremes, as the Buddha had done a thousand years before, as Jesus prayed and fasted in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, he follows that pattern of excessive mortification to the extent that he almost dies. He goes into a catatonic state for a period of more than a week, and he's nursed back to life by the good people of that place. It's there at Manresa, after that experience. It's there that he sat and waited, 
looking to the river that was running deep. And as he was seated there, the eyes of his understanding began to be opened, he said, and he understood and knew many things, spiritual things and matters of the faith and of learning. And this seemed so great an enlightenment, he said, that everything seemed new to him. Looking back 30 years later, he said it was the greatest enlightenment of his life. What to do? The ideal of the crusade was still there, yes. But before he could embark on that, he decided, I need to, to explore this experience. And there he begins to jot down notes of his waves of consolation and desperation and desolation, his experience of joy and sorrow, his experience of encountering the Lord in prayer, in quiet. And it's from those jottings that the spiritual exercises ultimately emerged. More next time. Thank you for your attention.